It's my great pleasure to introduce our friend Celia Butler speakers, Charles Hatfield and Joseph Sanders. Charles Hatfield is professor of English at California State University, Northridge, where he teaches comics, children's literature, and popular culture. Charles is the founder, founding president of the Comic Study Society, and he served on both the International Comics Arts Forum and the Modern Language Association Forum on Comics, excuse me, and Graphic Novels. Charles is the author of Alternative Comics and Hand of Fire, the comics of Jack Kirby. He's the co-editor of the Superhero Reader, and he's the curator of Comic Book Apocalypse, <laughs> America's largest ever exhibition of Jack Kirby art. Charles has published in the Children's Literature Association Quarterly, The Lion and the Unicorn, and other journals, and in the books Keywords for Children's Literature, The Oxford Handbook of Children's Literature, Teaching the Graphic Novel, and Comics in Descent. Charles is currently co-editing a comic studies guidebook and co-writing a book on cartoonist Eddie Campbell. Joseph of Sanders, is an associate professor in the children's literature track of the English department at Kansas State University. He is the winner of research fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Fulbright Program. His articles and book chapters on comics, fantasy, and children's nonfiction have appeared around the world. His book on classic orphan girls novels and a co-edited collection on the Secret Garden both appeared in 2011, and he has two new collections appearing this summer. The first, on great Belgian cartoonist Hergé, will be out in August from the University of Mississippi Press. And the other, which he co-edited with moi, <laughs> is currently available as a digital catalog accompanying the new exhibit on children's comics right here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at The Ohio State University. Please join me in welcoming Charles and Joe. Well, Michelle, thanks for that great introduction. We want to start by thanking a number of people. First, our brilliant host, Michelle Anna Bate, for nominating us to give us the Francilia Butler Lecture. Also, the Ohio State University, and especially the Billy, as it's known, the world-class Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. And, of course, also the Children's Literature Association, which has been a warm, supportive, and challenging intellectual home for both of us for years. I'd like to give a shout out to my fellow Comic Studies Society officer, Vice President and President-elect Carol Tilley, who's with us this morning. Uh, uh, and to my wife, Michelle Hatfield, without whom I could not do anything. <laughs> but she's here today. So our goal today is to take one specific theory, we'll call it the chaperone theory, uh, and chase its implications, that is, uh, put some pressure on it, it may be complicated. Uh, Joe put forth this theory in an essay published in 2011 in Children's Literature. Essentially, that essay takes up a long-running scholarly question whether there is actually a difference between comics, which are read sequentially, combine words and images, and are linked with children, and picture books which are read sequentially, combine words and images, and are linked with children. So, comparisons between the two uh, usually begin with form, but as Joe's essay notes, and as the 2012 Symposium on Picture Books and Comics in the Quarterly also shows, uh, these comparisons reach conclusions that are grounded in ideology and in the reading practices of different communities. To pry the two apart, the chaperoning theory takes two ideas from Roland Barthes. It starts from Barthes' observation that the meanings in images are infinite. We can look at an image and find any number of things to notice in it and conclusions to draw. Yet Barthes also said something else equally important. When we put images and words together, the words narrow the meanings possible. 
With this insight, Bart can explain how captions work. A photograph in a newspaper, for example, may mean different things, but when read in tandem with the caption, the meanings become restricted. The chaperoning theory takes up these ideas, but it adds in the widely documented observation that picture books tend to anticipate a dual audience. One composed of at least one person who's asked to read the words aloud, and at least one other person whose role is mainly to listen to the words as they're spoken. Of course, both audience members see the images while experiencing the words, and both experience the ways the words narrow the possible meaning of those images. However, when the proficient reader speaks the word aloud, they also shape the words, performing them in, a way, in ways that restrict their possible meanings. This reader, in effect, chaperones the words, nudging them toward one meaning and away from others. In this kind of reading situation, the words narrow the meaning of the images, and the performing reader further narrows the meaning of the words. This is chaperoning. So one of the things I really enjoy about Joe's uh, theory is his use of that very word chaperoning, implying an escort, guide, <laughs> and protector. With a little tip of the cap uh, to the Red Riding Hood, who, you know, though she walks into the woods alone, where is that famous chaperone implying her grandmother's love and concern? And one of the things I enjoy about Charles' reading of my essay is that he thinks I was clever enough to intend that reference. <laughs> which I was. <laughs> Comics, on the other hand, are designed to be read silently to oneself. This silent reader, too, will have a rich network of cultural and personal contexts in which the words signify, and will perform the words silently to themselves. Again, the process restricts the possible meaning of the words, which in turn restricts the possible meaning of the images. Comics, though, anticipate a solo reader who will chaperone the words internally, whereas picture books, the theory contends, anticipate a speaking reader who delivers them to a listener, chaperoning them out loud. In effect, the chaperoning theory recognizes that the picture book is not uh, simply an object, but a thing, a thing that hails the user and prompts a certain kind of response. To paraphrase Bill Brown, we might say that the term picture book names not so much an object as a subject-object relation. And readers of Robin Bernstein's Racial Innocence will know where we're going with this. Uh, in Robin's terms, the picture book is a scriptive thing, one embedded with cultural prompts or signals. Uh, it cannot compel behavior, but it does script our performance through both orders and pleasures, that is, both through the actions necessary for its use and through the delights that it offers. What the chaperoning theory attempts to do is expose the social life of, that is, the cultural prompts embedded within these two classes of scriptive things, comics and picture books. The theory extends to historical questions, such as why the US comic book industry established a self-censoring code, a question taken up at this very conference by Carol Tilley, Andrew O'Malley, Susan Honeyman, and ongoing ideological questions such as why we tend to feel profoundly sentimental toward picture books. Starting from a certain reading situation then, the theory expands out to examine the behavior and ideology which that reading situation engenders and protects. So what we want to do this morning is see what happens when we extend the chaperoning theory to two recent innovations in literature for children that combines words and images. Now the first of those innovations has to do with a critically and financially successful series that combines comics, which Joe deals with extensively in his theory, with early readers, which he completely ignores. Because he didn't have room. Uh, sure, sure, that's fine. that's fine. What we're talking about here is tune books, which places comics inside the picture book format. More precisely, a picture book series format in a common trade dress that echoes the little golden books but in a more durable, perhaps more highbrow form. The tune experiment, as conceived by founder and publisher Francoise Mouly, straddles the presumed line between collaborative and solitary reading, or between guided and autonomous reader. The history of tune in the, about the eight years since it launched reveals a company growing more and more aware of its own delicate positioning between the two different reading situations or cultural scripts that the chaperoning theory describes. 
Students' elaboration of its brand and format and gradual adoption of a pedagogical apparatus, including standard reading levels, suggests a concerted effort to help adults guide children in their encounters with the books. Toon's line, in short, anticipates both shared and solitary reading in ways that reflect the changing status of comics vis-a-vis -vis children's literature in this age of greater respectability. Austin 2008, uh, Toon has drawn on Francois Mouly's uh, decades of experience as a publisher, editor, and designer. She's perhaps best known now as the um, art editor for The New Yorker. Her husband and frequent collaborator, you may have heard of him, cartoonist Art Spiegelman, served as advisor to the project, but Toon Books emphatically was and is Mouly's vision. As Toon's editorial director, senior designer, and public face, Mouly may be America's best known advocate for children's comics. And in that role, she's won, among other honors, the Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award for, we know, education. If Toon has been a game changer in comics publishing, getting there took time. By the summer of 2007, when Mooley announced the venture, she'd spent years working to convince publishers to do children's comics and had pitched an imprint to, at the least, Abrams, Candlewick, HarperCollins, Hyperion, Penguin, and Scholastic. She may have been too early. A publisher says Mooley thought of this as a risky new category hard to place in bookstores. In her words, nobody wanted anything new then. Despite Mooley's success with Little Lit, a book series she co-edited with Art Spiegelman and published with Harper Collins and then with Puffin between 2000 and 2006. Finally, Mooley decided to publish Toon herself. In a sense, this project was a sequel to Little Lit and indeed was promoted as such for its first couple of years. Like Little Lit, Toon was and remains a project of Raw Junior, an arm of Mooley's longtime publishing company, Raw Books and Graphics, started back in 1978. Of course, Raw brought into the world both the avant-garde comics anthology Raw, co-edited by Mooley and Spiegelman, uh, and Spiegelman's own magnus opus, Mouse. So Toon traces its lineage back to the post-underground renaissance in comics that Raw and Mouse helped inspire. But Toon is something different, and in starting Toon as an independent house, Mooley aimed to position comics at the very heart of reading pedagogy and the educational literature. Uh, Toon's mission, as she has put it, is to provide bridge reading for children who are crossing over from conversational reading with adults to independent reading. Notably, Mooley regards most of the Toon line not as graphic novels, but as early readers, though ones which reject the idea that emerging readers need to be weaned from pictures. She has recalled trying to find good early readers for her son years before, and her frustration that most such books seemed, in her words, badly put together, marked by redundant and patronizing relationships between image and text. But by what she saw as a stifling insistence on reading as mere mechanics, um, we set out to create high quality hardcover comics that would recall the Bondesini albums that she grew up with uh, in France while also serving as stimulating early readers. Indeed, Mooley is known to request that the Toon books be shelved alongside other early readers not with graphic novels in order to highlight their learn-to-read potential. Toon then set out to insert itself into the very gap between shared picture book reading and more independent reading identified by the chaperoning theory. And so, its line mixes appeals to shared experience with appeals to solitary experience. While the whole project seeks to encourage independent reading, Toon reaches out to parents, teachers, and librarians, that's a quotation, and reserves a place for grown-ups in, in children's encounters with comics. In short, Toon inhabits an ambiguous or bridge position in the middle of the chaperone theory. Now these books pose um, the same questions that our own Annette Wanamaker has raised of early readers in general. How do they complicate the idea that Picture books anticipate an adult chaperone, one whose performance can guide or limit a text's meaning. Um, what sort of reader-text relationship do early readers anticipate? As Annette asks, asks, uh, do they fall into a space in between? As books sanction to aid younger readers in developing literacy, and again, those are Annette's words, do early readers short-circuit the chaperoning argument? Or do early readers, and the tune books in particular, seek to extend adult chaperoning into the solitary experience of emerging readers, 
providing them with that little red cap, that, that chaperone that accompanies the young reader on her or his way. It seems the tune represents a would-be compromise between uh, <laughs> comic book tradition, in which <clears throat> certain fans fondly recall experiences of autonomous self-selected reading, and the more obviously adult chaperoned experience of official children's literature. Tune certainly has taken steps to position itself within the larger field of children's publishing. From 2010 through 14, it partnered with Candlewick, relying on that company's distribution. By 2015, when Toon left Candlewick, its output had grown considerably. It's published 44 titles to date. Now, along the way, subtle changes have happened. For example, the line has shifted from books mostly copyrighted by Raw Jr. to books mostly copyrighted by the creators and publisher jointly. But the two most substantial changes have involved Toon's learn to read function and the deliberate positioning of Toon comics as educational books. One of these two big changes is the practice of dividing the Toon line into levels by age and skill groups. Level one, level two, level three. This practice began two to three years in during the Candlewick era, though Mooley had it in mind from the start. Nowadays, all Toon titles are leveled rather precisely. That is, they are not only geared toward ages three and up, but stratified by grade, lexile, guided, uh, guided reading level, reading recovery level, number of words, length and complexity of sentences, all correlated to Toon's in-house levels one, two, and three. Further, uh, Toon's leveling goes beyond grammar and diction to factor in the complexity of story, number of characters, and scope of the story world, distinguishing between a level one book with often just one character and a single time frame or theme, a level two book with a story involving few characters in a small world, and a level three book involving a broad world as well as shifts in time and place and a long story divided into chapters. Also, Toon does something that no other publisher is doing. Their levels take into account how complexly the books manipulate the comic's form. Level one books usually are limited to one or two panels per page, and level two books to four panels per page. So Toon has combined existing measures of readability and difficulty, such as Lexiles, with some consideration of what it means to level comics as comics. Tellingly, all three levels appeared on Toon's website before appearing within the books themselves. Uh, in the Candlewood period, according to Mooley, the sales force found this feature of the website particularly helpful in promoting the books. Candlewick, however, resisted the practice of leveling, afraid, in Mooley's words, to have anything that smacked too much of textbooks, as if textbooks might appear cheap or unliterary. This is the reason, according to Mooley, that she ended up splitting from Candlewick. By then, she had hired as marketing director Kimberly Guise, formerly of American Reading Company, which, as many of you know, stresses independent reading and academic achievement. Uh, Kimberly Guys joining in 2013 enlisted Suzanne Simons, also formerly of American Reading Company, to design a framework into which all the tune titles could be fit. Suzanne Simons is now at the uh, <coughs> Gates Foundation funded literacy design collaborative. This framework aligns with Common Core, first for any comics publisher, and informs Tune's so called genre study guide, which ties into lesson plans for every title. Now, reportedly, this study guide is now used in hundreds of schools. Uh, Suzanne Simons also helped organize the tune line thematically by social and emotional issues and by genre to aid book selection. And in those ways, tune has definitely changed since it started in 2008. And of course, for years, the book's back matter has included a page of tips for parents and teachers how to read comics with kids. Now, the second big change at tune was their founding in 2014 of a new line of graphic novels for older readers, ages eight and up, called the Toon Graphics. There have been a dozen books in this graphics line so far. So if Toon first set out to provide bridge reading for children that could also be shared by adults, Toon Graphics goes right for the independent child reader and embraces the term graphic novel in a way that the rest of the line has not. Though Toon promotes these older books almost as if they were a separate imprint, with its own identity, all of the Toon titles share the same website, catalogs, and editorial team. And in fact, the seat of the graphics line was a projected level four, 
that Mooley proposed early on, but later dropped. The tune graphics also contain instructive back matter, including often a page of tips for parents, teachers, and librarians. But these are tips of a different nature than those found in the, in the younger tune books. These tips stress the way comics, um, and I'm quoting here, sharpen readers' literal and inferential reading skills. And they also stress the intellectual richness that the word and image mixture in comics makes possible. Above all, they stress the young reader's capacity for making meaning on their own. In contrast, the tips in the other tune books consist of imperatives, guide young readers, talk about the pictures, and call on adults to assign roles, point out features, and check understanding. Tune graphics, on the other hand, stress reading as an independent discovery. Now, the tune graphics telegraph this difference by their very design. While sharing a similar trade dress, they're larger than the standard six by nine inch size of the other tune releases, <clears throat> getting closer to conventional comic books and graphic novels um, in their dimensions, or closer to the Bay Day albums of Mooley's youth. Also, the tune graphics are longer books, from 48 to well over 100 pages. By contrast, all level one tune books are nine by six inch books in landscape format, that familiar oblong so conducive to conversational reading and strict sequencing. This format may be because they usually contain only one or two panels per page. And so the reader's default move is left to right, not top to bottom. That is, these books seldom stack panels. That landscape format, as I pointed out in my chaperoning essay, has an ideological dimension, anticipating a dual readership in which a speaking reader will chaperone the words. The horizontal book enables a speaking reader to spread the book over two laps while performing the words for the listening reader. Notably, the level one titles are the only books that Tune does in this horizontal or landscape format. The level two and three books, by contrast, are always six by nine inch portrait format books. Such differences in format reinforce a distinction now made explicit within the book's apparatus and in catalogs and online. Level ones are first comics for brand new readers. Level twos are for emerging readers. Level threes are chapter book comics for advanced beginners. And two graphics are for full-fledged visual readers. So the tune books, as scripted things, divide up their readership implicitly through differences in packaging that subliminally encourage solitary reading or rereading as you move up the levels. With illustrious creators like Neil Gaiman, Lorenzo Vittori, uh, the tune graphics echo a highbrow graphic novel aesthetic comfortable to adult readers. However, uh, Mooley insists that the that tune overall seeks to reach into schools and libraries, not preach to the converted comics fan. Reasoning that schools and libraries will enable tune to reach children and families, Mooley says that tune is now going back appealing to educators at least as much as the consumer market. Exposure to comics outside the home, she believes, will drive the future, and she wishes, in her words, to give the educators, quote, all the reassurance and the ammunition needed to legitimize comics. So Tune's expanded educational apparatus, time to exploit Common Core, represents no less than an attempt to redefine the social life of comics within schools and libraries. Now, I believe I recognized something like this eight years ago, and I reviewed the first three tune titles. I did not love them, uh, and my review uh, called the books... No, wait, let me do this part. <laughs> I love these lines. <clears throat> His review called the books surprisingly undaring, <laughs> and lamented the lines Dampening sense of conformity. I asked who the books were for, and whether they were meant as shared read-aloud books or as solo read-alone challenges. I complained that the books denied the antic inventiveness of comics in favor of an adult-centered agenda. Adult-centered agenda. Dampening sense of conformity. Remember, these were the people behind some of the edgi edgiest, most acerbically anti-establishment comics around. Then they start making books for children, and Charles calls their books surprisingly undaring. 
It must have felt like splinters beneath their nicotine-stained fingernails. <laughs> it just does my blackened little heart good. <laughs> I have to say that since then my, my views have shifted. A bit. No! <laughs> and yeah, my views have shifted. I've come to appreciate the agenda as a, a sort of achievement in itself, uh, despite my mistrust of lexiles and other reading metrics and my dislike of standards based education reform in general. And you know, to be fair, since then, Tune has published some delightful books. But my first encounter with the Tune line unearthed, as I noted back then, my own assumptions about comics uh, that, that are generally for solo self-selected reading rather than conversational reading, that's a point that Joe has also made, uh, and that they tend to work better as fugitive reading than as part of a step into reading program. So, you know, I have to admit, my appreciation of Tune was blocked by my own memories of comics as individual discovery as opposed to a type of reading shaped by adult solicitude. So back then, I worried that Tune, and, and uh, this is, these are the words I used back in 2008, might smother the very quality of comics that spoke to me so powerfully as a child, their liberatory escapist quality. And I suggested that the cultural script of comics readers might resist the Tune program. Now, in a way, that me, you know, eight years ago, seems like a voice from another world. But then again, uh, I do think that my gut response back then turned up something useful. Um, uh, I'd say that, in effect, my response anticipated the chaperone theory, confirming Joe's point. Well, I guess that's okay, though. <laughs> if the careful positioning of Tune as a comics publisher that makes picture books confirms the importance of adult chaperoning in the picture book field, then another current development in picture books seems to challenge that traditional chaperoning role. That development is technological and may take us beyond comics in a strict sense. One day, while I was working hard on this talk, which is to say that I was not in fact working on it, but instead messing around on Facebook, <laughs> I came across a, a post by Maria Nikolaeva expressing outrage that anyone could write at length about picture books without even recognizing the existence of digital picture books. As someone who had written at length about picture books without recognizing the existence of digital picture books, I quietly closed Facebook and decided that I should maybe recognize the existence of digital picture books. Uh, this is an issue that's been taken up at our own conference this weekend, um, uh, for example, in panels 1A and 3B. Now, when Joe brought his thinking about digital picture books to me, I confess I did not warmly adopt what he had to say. <laughs> I was skeptical. I expect some of you may have the same reaction. So if our goal today has been to explore the chaperoning theory further, here we come to an extension of the theory. It may not be wrong, but still it leaves me a bit uncomfortable. The good news is that if you think what I'm about to suggest is wrong, there is plenty of room to disagree. Not in the hallway, not in here. Uh, though Charles and I were trained in and work in literature departments, we admit that our friends in education have done a better job and for a longer time than we have, thinking about not only digital picture books, but electronic books in general. They have not, however, come to any clear consensus. Um, one study finds that electronic texts increase children's comprehension, but, quote, the practical effects of this technology are likely to be moderate to small. Another study argues that children who looked at an electronic version of a text took longer both to read the electronic text and to complete a comprehension test about that text. Multiple experiments find that children are distracted by the so-called bells and whistles, that's a term that shows up repeatedly, the bells and whistles of electronic texts. But another test found that children were not distracted by the multimedia traits of e-books, and indeed found that, quote, the film-like on-screen electronic book was more beneficial for children's language development than multiple encounters with static books. <laughs> the conclusions of essay after essay tend to signal alarm at the stultification of learning enforced by the use of electronic books, or alarm at the opportunities for learning lost because of the lack of such use. Of course, concerns about digital picture books do not stem solely from such practical Considerations. I mean, instead, they spring from a sense of disquiet at the thought of a machine taking the place of the human being in the role of chaperone while a child reads a picture book. I, um, I, I raise this concern with Joe. 
actually, that disquiet is a major theme of the work done by education theorists. Very often, the fears expressed in these essays are pegged to the way picture books provide opportunities for bonding between children and their caregivers. Marianne Evans and her colleagues, for example, celebrate how adults, while reading a print book with a child, quote, play an active and important role in engaging the child by elaborating the text, asking questions, and relating the content of the print, the story, and the illustrations to the child's experience, and by coaching children to decode the words when they take on the reader role. They follow by expressing concern that, quote, parents may confer upon interactive ebooks the role of the surrogate adult in the reading process. Evans and her co writers also worry about this. Will ebooks, these are their words, have the effect of minimizing the mediation role that parents now typically play when reading it to children? Adina Shamir and Ofer Karak observe that, and I'm quoting here, ebooks directed at young children incorporate this understanding about the role of narrative and adult mediation reading skills into their software and application modes. In other words, the bells and whistles of electronic books, such as digital picture books, represent a replacement of the adult chaperone. Vivian Howard's recent survey of participants in the One Book Nova Scotia program found that parents shared this concern, that they did not want to use an electronic version of a books with their children because, quote, they felt that by using an electronic device, it really cut into their bonding time with their kid. The mediation role that education theory attributes to the older reader is replaced by the interactive abilities of the e-book. Now, I would argue that the anxiety stirred by digital books uh, and this fear of losing bonding time to a machine are exactly related. I know that Toon Books, which encourages caregivers to introduce comics into their children's reading lives, appeals to the notion of bonding time by stressing precisely the material and haptic qualities of the traditional physical book. That is, by stressing the shared experience of, in Francoise Mouly's words, holding a treasure. Bonding over a physical thing. Again, it's a scriptive thing, a scriptive thing that prompts readers to sit close together and share quiet time is a feature of the picture book tradition that Tune Books means to hold on to. This sense of closeness or intimacy implied by the traditional picture book transaction is seen, as Joe notes in his essay, not as incidental to the task of learning to read, but crucial. Crucial. Uh, it is for many definitionally crucial, emotionally crucial, and culturally crucial. Uh, Ellen Handler Spitz epitomizes this when she calls adult picture book reading to children a form of parenting through cultural experience and highlights the vital role of grown-ups as, in her words, mediators between children and the cultural objects they encounter. So in this light, removing any part of the chaperoning process from the adults to the device would seem to jeopardize not just the definition of picture books, but the cherished role that adults play in scripting the child's induction into culture. However, I would argue that, precisely because we know that picture books are designed to inculcate a warm reading experience, we must be pointedly skeptical of studies that dismiss electronic picture books merely because of the deep investment that we have in more traditional picture books, the emotional investment that traditional picture books foster. We know we love picture books and the bonding time that print picture books allow, so we're inevitably going to dread the loss of that bonding time and going to look for reasons to justify the distaste we have for new media that rob us of it. It might be that, as we continue to research e-books, we discover that digital picture books are indeed inferior to print picture books. <laughs> that e-books are even bad. But I believe we have to earn that conclusion, not start with it. And our deep affection for print picture books is going to make doing so very difficult. Okay, so I, I, get, I get that. <laughs> right. um, but I know that some research does back up the point that electronic books are worse for young readers. For example, Julia Parrish Morris and her colleagues have observed that children communicate less while well, consuming electronic books than they do while reading print books. Shamir and Korat find that the multimedia features that are directed primarily at arousing or maintaining a child's interest and motivation to read can simultaneously distract the child from the ebook's narrative and educational substance. 
Now that's not an objection that comes simply from an effort to protect that sort of warm, cuddly reading experience of picture books. It raises the possibility that the very things that make e-books e-books may also make them worse at helping children focus on what is important in those books. Other researchers observed that children using e-books spent much of their time playing games found in the e-book. Uh, if children, like all of us, get distracted by those bells and whistles, e-books may be worse at being books. Yes, but in each of those studies, the researchers defined reading in a way that took for granted the structures of reading implicit in the traditional picture book format. When Parrish Morris and her co-writers observed that children reading electronic books communicated less, they also noted that those exact same children, quote, demonstrated greater persistence when using this format. You could argue that the electronic format's firmer grip on its reader's attention presents a golden opportunity for educators such as these. But instead, they seem to reduce this important quality to mere utility as a leisure time supplement. Although children like reading these kinds of books and keep trying to read them even when the material is difficult, such books are somehow only valuable as supplements? Also, when Shamir and Porat complain that ebooks distract the child from narrative and educational substances, who determines what the narrative and educational substance is? Is it fair to define as the substance of an ebook only those things that are not animated by bells and whistles? If I write a good picture book and publish it in print, then I take advantage of the artistic possibilities of print. I use the page turn, the irony between words and images, the shape of the book, and every other element to carry the narrative and educational substance of that book. Why then, if I create an ebook and articulate my artistic vision through the bells and whistles, why would the reader's attention to the bells and whistles simply be a form of distraction? When a reader focuses on how the page turn works in a traditional picture book, do we say that the reader is distracted by that mundane bell and or whistle? Similarly, how are the games that a book designer puts in a book somehow not a substantial part of that book? When these researchers complain that ebooks are inferior to traditional books, it seems that they reach that conclusion because they defined the value of those books narrowly. Their conclusions are foreordained by the terms of their analysis. Good point. In fact, it's such a good point, Joe, I find myself wondering whether you wrote my objections in such a way as to set up your own rebuttals. <laughs> but that would be disingenuous. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's say I'm reluctantly convinced but implied in your argument is a question that still leaves me uncomfortable. What if it's good that children don't need an adult mediator for electronic text? After all, you're arguing that we shouldn't take for granted that replacing the adult mediator with a device is bad. Doesn't that open the possibility that it's positively good? I was really hoping that you wouldn't raise that point. <laughs> you should not have written it in the script. <laughs> I do think there is some evidence that just maybe it is a good thing that ebooks relocate the chaperoning experience. For example, one early study found that when children read texts with enabled hotspots, they were more likely to look up words than children who found unfamiliar words in a print document, who would simply skip those words or continue reading. The authors of the study proposed that students did not ask for assistance to avoid embarrassment. Later researchers, in reflecting on the earlier studies, referred to the experience of the children who used hotspot-enabled texts as an experience of the privacy of failure. The request for help is private. So what you're saying is these children who were reading a book to themselves in the presence of their teacher preferred not to avail themselves of that human helper but instead, we're more likely to get help from the device. So that too would be a form of chaperoning, right? The unfamiliar word has a wide range of meanings, and the online dictionary that you can click on narrowed the possibility of those meanings. The children chose not to accept chaperoning from an adult then, but sought it out from the computer privately, so they were willing to receive help only from the device. Kind of makes your skin crawl, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> 
Consider, too, the aspects of a book that a computer-chaperoned text might be better at helping a child understand than those aspects traditionally appreciated by human chaperones. Evans and her colleagues point to earlier research on the facets of print books that adults rarely notice, at least in any way that communicates the adult's visual literacy to the children to whom they read. If electronic books were designed properly, they could potentially uniformly do what parents do not, they say. For example, quote, when reading to young children, including preschoolers who are in the process of learning the alphabet in North American society, parents rarely comment on aspects of the print. So digital picture books could build in rewards that encourage the development of a literacy that the traditional chaperoning scene ignores. And what about all of the other great terms of visual analysis? Electronic books have the potential to reward children, and for that matter, adults, for better attention to choices of medium, line quality, color value, and even allusions to other visual texts. None of this instruction, though, would show up in the modes of evaluation currently aimed at electronic texts, as none of these is something that fits within the narrow definition of reading currently taken for granted in those analyses. But the point remains, it's possible that children would enjoy and even understand texts more richly if those texts were mediated by, well, media. You notice our fingers are getting a real workout? They are. <laughs> now, this debate about the value of e-texts echoes in the comics world, in the form of an ongoing tug war between print and digital cultures. On the one hand, comics fandom has included many early adopters of online culture. Native web comics have been a thing since at least the mid-90s, with distinct web comics culture running parallel to comic book and graphic novel fandom. The casual use of the term web comic dates at least as far back as 1995, and devotees will tell you that the genre has been around even longer. Web comics continue to be a distinct and thriving genre, uh, strongly linked to millennial youth culture and tech culture. At the same time, the web has been a platform for various experiments in serializing comics, and independent creators have used online social networking, e-commerce, and crowdfunding to support and shine a spotlight on alternative works, both online and in print. Meanwhile, the so-called mainstream periodical comic book has partly become digitized, thanks to cloud-based distribution platforms such as the Comixology app, which was launched in 2009. These apps have enabled easy and convenient reading of e-comic books in the realm of tablets and smartphones. The appetite for such became stronger in 2011 when uh, major superhero publishers, Marvel and DC, announced so-called same-day and date publishing of electronic titles alongside their print counterparts. So digital comics and online digital adjuncts to print comics are now a vital part of comics culture. However, the world of collectible print comics has not collapsed as some prophets of the digital future predicted. In fact, many in the comic book and graphic novel industry credit digital distribution, along with the popularity of comic book-based films and other media, for expanding the audience for print comics and diversifying comics fandom. Digital sampling, according to some comics retailers, has boosted their brick-and-mortar business. Um, so, therefore, journalistic and scholarly conversations about comics fandom are drastically different today than they were even a decade ago. At the same time, the rise of the e-comic has sparked a reappraisal of the haptic and material appeals of print comics, that is, a reconsideration of the virtues and appeal of paper. If comics culture has included avid adopters of digital tech, it's also encouraged what Adam McGovern has called the repopulation of paper. That is, the willful embrace of the printed medium with a renewed appreciation for comics as objects. Today, there's a symbiosis between print and online channels, with fandom taking to the web to talk about comics while also supporting a collector's culture that highly values the materiality of books. In this regard, consider Chris Ware's simultaneous experiment with an iPad comic app and his development of the boxed set of narratives called Building Stories, 
a lavish collection of 14 objects, booklets, pamphlets, broadsheets, that can be read in any order yet tell a unified story. A treasure trove of printed material, building stories at once, fulfills and perfectly flouts the, rear, the literary ideal of the graphic novel. Or closer to children's publishing, perhaps consider Jason Chico's Meanwhile, which is a branching choose-your-own-adventure comic with more than 3,000 possible outcomes. It can be experienced either as a bound graphic novel or as an iOS app. Also consider graphic novels that self-consciously engage with their own bookness. For example, Gene Yang's dialectical two-volume novel, Boxers and Saints. Consider, too, those graphic novels like Noel Stevenson's Nimona and so many others that basically grew up online through digital serialization. This burgeoning new culture of comics and books, on and off the printed page, raises new questions about chaperoning, the autonomy of readers, and shared versus solitary reading experiences. A graphic novel has now become an accepted part of children's literature. That's the era that the work of people like Gene Yang and so many others has helped usher in. Still, the social unease or the profound challenges raised by the empowered young reader are nowhere near over. The fault lines exposed by the question of young readers' autonomy remain just that. Further, the explosion of comics culture online reminds us that though comics reading may be mainly a matter of flying solo, alone, comics fans often feel a powerful urge to communicate their reading experiences their likes, dislikes, and interpretations to each other. Maybe it's not a matter of independent reading, but interdependent reading. The legitimization of the graphic novel, the recognition of that reading culture, and the rise of digital books all underscore the issues of power and participation raised by the chaperoning theory. What we've said about the possibilities of the digital picture book and what the transformations in comics culture today reveal is that the visual culture of image text reading, both on and offline, will keep challenging the ways we perceive young people's literacy. We need to see beyond our anxieties and recognize the struggles for power within the reading lives and literary practices of children. Thank you. Thank you. Preguntas, por favor. Have you any questions? What questions do you have? Michelle. Oh. Yeah. Michelle? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about um, the fact that much of the, the argument is based on an assumption of that if you have a human chaperone, that that human chaperone is going to be literate and that the children at some point are going to be on the positive side of the digital divide. Yeah. And I was wondering for those who have literate parents, you know, are working three jobs, and they don't have time to do to the kids. Yeah. Is there any way in which the asset, electronic direction that's going, is also going to be able to support those children who don't have that option of I, you know, there are, there are lots of ways to begin answering this. Uh, one is that um, there's, a, there's a really great work of comic scholarship uh, called The Ten Cent Plague, in which uh, the author argues, had you, David Hayju, yeah. David Hayju uh, argues that, um, that comics actually, uh, especially newspaper comics, also anticipated an illiterate audience, uh, especially in the early 20th century. So it's, it's possible that as we think about how to answer that question, we could go back to that as a place to think about how um, the kind of uh, older uh, reader you're thinking of might fit into this. Um, yeah, now the educational theory has definitely demonstrated that when an ebook has an audio track to it, that even the people who want to hate electronic books recognize that in those instances, literacy frequently improves. So I think, Michelle, that that's, that's really a great point, that, that if we're thinking about ebooks in the hands of people whose proficient readers, whether they're older siblings or uncles or, or grandparents or parents or whatever, 
uh, if they're not there as often as is normally imagined by the kind of bourgeois uh, picture book. I, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence to say that actually e-books could be really good for them. Yeah, I think this raises an issue you referred to the bourgeois picture book. That, um, that thing that we've been calling the cultural script of the picture book, which is distinct from the reality of people, families, and individual readers actually living with and working with picture books, but that, that implied cultural script of picture books is sort of a class-bound script. But we find this to be generally true with children's literature. It's a real struggle, right? Thank you. Further questions? Yes? Do you have any speculation on how e-books for children and, and e-book picture books um, affect the future adult readers you know, as they grow up, be that they'll have to be dependent on electronic readers? Um, okay. Uh, there's no there's no data for this, right? It just hasn't been around long enough for us actually to know. So you're asking me to speculate, which means I can just make up whatever I want. <laughs> so, uh, um, according to the chaperoning theory, the, the chaperoning theory uh, does not imagine a case in which uh, emerging readers become utterly dependent uh, on the, the thing or person reading to them. In the existing, in the previous 2013 version of the shepherding theory, I was thinking about uh, picture books and there would be a, there would be a preliterate reader and a proficient reader. The proficient reader is reading to the preliterate reader and at no point did anybody assume that this younger person would, would grow up only able to read with the help of that proficient reader, right? I think that if we extend this then, there really isn't any reason to think that that person is, is going to be reliant upon uh, another chaperone, human or digital or whatever. So again, there's no, there are no data, so we don't really know. But um, my guess is that no, we will not grow up any more dependent on electronics than we were dependent on our parents to read to us in the old model. What do you think? Well, I mean, one of the things that um, we arrived at this morning, I think, is a recognition that no one's really reading alone, right? and, and no one's really uh, having uh, this sort of lonely, atomistic, you know, wholly isolated literacy experience. Not you, not me, not people young or old. Um, uh, we all need to speak to one another and make sense out of those things that we've read. And you can see that in the, um, the sort of traditional scenario of picture book use that, that uh, I mean, very often, we ask our readers or co-readers of picture books to read some of those lines and take up some of those parts and to trade off with us and rehearse, basically. So, I mean, I think the question really may have to do with whether e-books um, perform that kind of social modeling that, that brings the, the budding reader into that sort of Vygotskyan zone of proximal development where they can learn from others, right? Um, that's one of the concerns I think that ebooks raise. Natalie? Yeah, that, that was kind of where I was going because I was thinking about the difference between um, functional literacy and critical literacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, and maybe that, that the idea of legitimating comics or legitimizing comics and that um, what you call the uh, adult centered agenda of mm -hmm. books. Um, you know, do we want to uh, learn our functional literacy from Francois Lully and Mark Spiegelman, or do we want to learn it from random developer on iTunes. And so that I was thinking a lot about that the critical literacy piece, which um, you know, I, I, like where that begins to come in and, and how the functional literacy of the kids looking up the definition of the word provided for them um, turns into a critical um, component. And I think there's there's that word between the picture book and the comic again, because the comic in some ways has that independent or uh, or well, I, anecdotally, I can tell you, I mean, these stories are legion. If you talk to anybody who read a lot of comic strips or comic books when they were young, and many of them will remember, and I remember where I encountered particular words for the first time uh, in kind of an unchaperoned way, doppelganger, placebo. I can tell you where I found those Howard the Duck placebo. <laughs> I mean, so there's that sense of, again, coming back to the kind of the e-book example of looking up unfamiliar words. And of course, if first you pronounce it placebo, you have no idea what it means. You struggle, but that is, um, 
that ability to struggle on your own is something to, to value, but again, again, the hotspot, that kind of thing gives you a window into something vast, potentially. All right, so uh, I, I feel very double about that, Joe. Uh, actually, I'm going to uh, let Charles have all of the brilliant insights because our beloved president signals that we are now out of time. So thank you very much for this. Thank you.